And now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for. Tonight, a legend comes to the Whitehall Theatre and Multipurpose Leisure Complex Plus Conference Facility. <laughs> a living treasure, an icon, if you will, a human heritage site. A man who's come to symbolize the new Australia and Australian values to communities all over the globe. We are proud to present elder statesman, ombudsperson, diplomat, family man, sportsman, sporting identity, sport, wit, spin doctor, orator, internationally acclaimed cheese connoisseur and world class achiever. Now on the latest leg of his international charm offensive, your standing ovation please for Dr. Sir Leslie Colin Patterson! <laughs> Permit me to introduce myself to you good people, if I may. My name is Liz Patterson! And if I may say so... If I may say so on this lovely night, in London City at the historic Scheitel Theatre. <laughs> We're all looking pretty good. And if you think I'm looking good, let's hear you say you're looking good, Liz. How am I looking, ladies and gentlemen? No worries, we're going to get along like a house on fire tonight. <laughs> because I'm feeling good. And I'm smelling good too, because I've got a good squirt of the duty-free Paco Rabanne. <laughs> the Paco Rabanne in the armpits. And I'm ready for action, girls, no worries. <laughs> and I'm feeling dangerous. <laughs> but pull yourselves together, for Christ's sake. I think I know what all you women are staring at, huh? <laughs> You're all looking at my penis, aren't you? <laughs> and there he is, ladies and gentlemen. There he is. Yeah. <laughs> Laurie. Oh, Laurie Holloway, my, my fine, upstanding penis. God love him. Uh. But I bet... <laughs> Here's former cultural attaché to the Court of St James and chairman of the Australian Cheese Board. I am. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I bet a lot of you good folk here tonight, I bet you didn't recognise Les on account of the weight that I have lost. Isn't it incredible? <laughs> Snake Hips Patterson at your service. <laughs> because I've, I've cleaned up my act. I have become a fitness freak. <laughs> I think I'll say that again. <laughs> a fitness freak! <laughs> and... And big announcement! I am completely off the grog. I am. I'm a teetotal. I don't drink at all, except for the occasional glass of Chardonnay. <laughs> now, I can hear a few know-alls out here, and there's always a know-all. Know-all, know nothing, as my mother used to say. <laughs> I can hear a few know-alls saying, come off at Les, isn't Chardonnay an alcoholic drink? And to you, I say, with the greatest respect, Pig's ass. <laughs> Pig's ass. The beverage in this goblet bears about as much resemblance to a serious drink 
as a dry peck on the cheek from my wife Gwen does to a long night out in a Bangkok rub and tug shop. <laughs> Funnily enough, by coincidence, I was in Bangkok uh, only the other day, you know, where I go on a regular basis to get the old rocket polished. And, uh, <laughs> Bang Bangkok is a good name for it too. I, the fellow who named that city had his head screwed on the right way. <laughs> But whenever I go to old bangers, as we call it, in the diplomatic fraternity, I get off the plane, I'm always a little bit stiff. I am due, due to the vibrations of the jumbo. And so when I go to the hotel, I generally ask the old concierge to point me in the direction of an establishment specialising in a bit of in-depth relief massage. You with me? <laughs> this little bloke. This little bloke indicates a place conveniently just round the corner from the hotel that smelt reassuringly of Dettol. And uh, <laughs> I pointed myself in, in that direction. And, uh, and uh, well, I pointed myself in that direction and the rest of me followed. And, uh, what I didn't know was that this place was a chiropodist because my request had suffered in translation, you see, and, uh, and so I've been directed to the wrong place by this little slant-eyed yellow bastard behind the desk. <laughs> oh, please, 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 I mean that with the greatest respect, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> please, well, to anyone who happens to be in the concierge community here tonight. <laughs> However, I always ask their advice because of an old saying, I don't know where it is, perhaps in the Gideon Bible, but when you're feeling the urge, ask the old concierge. <laughs> so there I am. There I am. There I am in this establishment. And tell you what, I'm feeling pretty horny. I'm as randy as a rattlesnake, you know. I'm that randy I could root the hair on a barber shop floor. <laughs> You know the feeling, fellas, and, I, and I'm shown into a little cubicle. Very small, I think. I'm not going to get much more than a knee trembler in here. <laughs> and I'm in there for a while, very toey, very agitated, and all of a sudden a lovely little Thai sheila comes in. Oh, beautiful. She must have had one on her like a mouse's ear. <laughs> She's wearing a white uniform and she's got a little tin dish in her hand and a towel over her arm. So I whips out the old purple-headed warrior. <laughs> yeah, I, I flashed my frightener. And, uh, she screams and drops her accoutrement. She said, that's not a foot. I said, no, but it's near enough. I said, <laughs> Isn't that delightful, ladies and gentlemen? There it is. True story happened last Thursday. But I can hear a lot of you people say, no, but Les, Les, what was the moment of truth? You know, what was the sea change in Les Patterson's life that caused me to go on this massive health kick, I'll tell you? I made a discovery, a sickening, bloody discovery about myself. I discovered I was a slob. <laughs> Oh, there were warning signs. There were, like sometimes after a long night out on the source, I'd wake up in strange places that scared the shit out of me. Like in bed with my wife, for example. <laughs> I had such a gut on me, I had such a gut on me, I couldn't cut my own toenails. I couldn't see my feet. I could get my rocks off, but I couldn't get my socks off. <laughs> I had to get my secretaries and Girl Fridays and research assistants to cap my toenail for me. 
And they jumped at it too. Some dropped right out one cheer on each foot, working away in the hope of higher things. <laughs> there, there I was, good people. I was a slob. I, I, you know, I'd sunk low. I was a pissant. I was a bloody animal. Gross. So low. I was lower than a snake's arsehole. I was. <laughs> I could have parachuted out of a snake's arsehole. <laughs> And still free fall, I could have been. <laughs> I was lower than Linford Christie's jockstrap. I was. And that swing's pretty low, they tell me. I was lower than Divine Brown's chin on a Saturday night. <laughs> That's about as low as you can get. Oh, I had I was a disgrace to the Australian diplomatic community. And believe you. <laughs> <laughs> me. To be a disgrace to the Australian diplomatic community, take some fucking doing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do forgive me. That just slipped out. <laughs> you know the feeling, ladies? However, I had desecrated the God-given temple of my body. And you should have seen my body. Hang on now, there's a young woman down here who has seen my body, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. I think it may be my former research assistant, Yvonne Sullivan. Is that you, Yvonne? <laughs> oh, darling. Sorry, I didn't recognise your face. <laughs> the top of your head rang a bell. <laughs> Oh, lovely. Oh, you know, she used to be my laptop, ladies and gentlemen. She, did. <laughs> she was deductible. She used to come under office equipment. <laughs> so did I, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but isn't it lovely? Isn't it lovely to see what cordial terms I am on with the hornbags and and ceiling inspectors of my past. And that's, that's because I'm a gentleman, good folk. A gentle man. I just slip it in and say, walk slowly towards me. <laughs> <laughs> but I can hear you all saying, as with one voice, get on with it, Les. What was your road to Damascus on the fitness front? What, <laughs> what caused, what, uh, what, what, I don't remember drinking that. <laughs> what? what caused Les Patterson to give up the grog except for a few harmless table wines? It was a man, ladies and gentlemen, good folk of London town. One man, but no ordinary man, a prince amongst men. I refer to none other than the former Prime Minister of Australia, a tall, sardonic, upstanding streak of piss from the wrong side <laughs> from the wrong side of the tracks, who left school at eleven and took the economic recovery of Australia fairly by the throat, and incidentally attained the unique distinction of getting his hand up the Queen's freckle. <laughs> and he said to me, Les, he looked at me, you know, he said, You're a mess, he said. He said, You couldn't do two rounds with a revolving door. He said, you look like a born-again Oliver Reed, he said to me, with the breath of Boris Yeltsin. He said, he said to me, you look like Senator Edward Kennedy on a good day. <laughs> that hurt, ladies and gentlemen. That stung me because I'm a sensitive organism with a sensitive organism. And comparing me with Teddy Kennedy, a card-carrying piss artist from way back. Mind you, credit where credit's due. I mean, not every bloke with a skin full can open a car door underwater, let's face it. <laughs> However, I went ape. I went bananas. I grabbed that Prime Minister by his arm, Arnie Lapels. I said, you ungrateful bastard, I said, you dickhead. I said, is that all the thanks I get for swinging the Olympic Games for Sydney 2000? I said, is that all the things I get for shafting Manchester and getting the Games for Australia? For ascertaining the most approachable member of the Olympic Games Committee and slipping him a brown paper bag to use Swiss francs in the privacy of a Monte Carlo shithouse? Because it was me. 
drunk or sober, the goddamn games of Sydney 2000. They think they won it on their own merits, but they didn't. How could they? <laughs> However, I went away and I was hurt. I was cut to the quick, Laurie, because, you know, I, I thought, what have I done wrong? You know, just enjoy life, I'm convivial. And then I thought, truthfully, I thought i have been nudging the Terps a bit hard. <laughs> and when fellas used to fill up my glass, they'd say, say when, Les, I'd say when it's running over me knuckles, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> that applies to all of us, doesn't it, fellas? <laughs> However, I'll say this. <laughs> hey, come off it. Dirty bastards, you're looking, <laughs> looking for some hidden fucking agenda in what I'm saying? Ooh. It's, uh, it's nice out tonight, I think I'll leave it out. <laughs> However, ladies and gentlemen, I did, I, Jesus, I did, I cleaned up my act, I did. I did, and it was a very different Les Patterson that went back into that man's office a few days later. It was the Les you see tonight, trim, fit, at the height of my powers as a man and as a diplomat. And when I went in there... <laughs> when I went into that office, I'm, te I'm, I'm telling you this, I... Uh, <laughs> I... Uh, I said... Camembert, it is. It is. That's what comes to sitting on the cheese board all morning. <laughs> Not to mention those little flags that get up your ass. <laughs> but when the Prime Minister of Australia seen me, sober and clean, he said, shit a brick, Liz, he said, you're a fucking phoenix, he said to me. <laughs> In that lovely statesman-like way that he's got with him. He said, you've done wonders. You've even got rid of the nicotine stains, except for the ones on your fingers. <laughs> so I said, uh... <laughs> So I said, well, I've done my best five minutes. He said, you've done that well, Les. He said, I'm going to give you an important job, and this is a biggie and highly confidential. He said, now you've got them games to Sydney. He said, how are we going to pay for it? He said, we're broke. I said, shit, I said. <laughs> I said, you need major sponsorship. You need money, with t you need telephone numbers. I said, you, you need a sponsor. I know a pharmaceutical company, I told him, that's hot to trot. They'll come to the party. Heard of Tampax? <laughs> I said, I could jump on a jumbo to Johnson & Johnson and pull a few strings, I said to him. <laughs> There's a stony-faced old Sheila sitting over here. <laughs> She's got a head on her like a half-suck mango, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Last time I saw a head like that, it had a hook in it. I kid you not. <laughs> I reckon when she was a kitty, they had to hang a, hang a chop around her neck to get the dog to play with her. <laughs> Nothing personal, madam, I assure you. You can't win them all, though, can you, eh? Oh boy, oh boy. However, I got the job. He said, we're happy with you, Les. You've got a nephew. You've got the ideas. Get out there. Pick up your gold cards, your expenses. Get out there and sell. Get to the Whitehall Theatre. Raise money. Raise the profile of Australia. And that's what I've been doing, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I've been doing. Because I'm a great believer in the feel-good factor. I'm telling you that. And I've been travelling. I've been busy. Busy. Talk about busy. I've been as busy as a blowfly up a bull's bum lately. I've been, I've been as busy as a Bosnian bricklayer. I have. I've, I've been as busy as Salman Rushdie's travel agent. I, 
<laughs> I've been as busy as a one-legged lesbian on a pogo stick. I have. <laughs> Have you got a mental picture of that? <laughs> By the way, I'm the only Les who isn't on Channel 4, have you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> oh. What's a pogo stick, says the old Batlax down here. Well, <laughs> madam, it's, it's a third leg, darling. I'll give you a demo later. <laughs> I've been in Rome, good people. Like, only the other day on a stopover, I love Rome. Magnificent. Been to Rome, Laurie? No, I haven't. Fan body testing, <laughs> marvellous. When I go to Rome, I make straight for the old cistern chapel. I love that, that cistern chapel. Fantastic. Beautiful. There's those hand-done murals all over the ceiling. Don't know who done them, some poor bastard who... I think he cut off his legs, stuck them in a jiffy bag and sent it to a waitress. I think he did. I don't know who it was. <coughs> Bert Lancaster, I think. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that Thai meal. I'd forgotten. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. mm. mm. <laughs> Nothing like bridge work for a few memories, eh? <laughs> no. Oh, those lovely murals up there, though. And another thing that appeals to me very strongly about the old cistern is the backpackers. Beautiful young female backpackers. I'm not a backpacker myself, mind you, but I'm a front packer, ladies, eh? <laughs> oh, well, here's a good one, <laughs> an observation of mine. <laughs> uh, you know, how do you, how do you pick a New Zealand backpacker who's got her periods? <laughs> when she's only wearing one sock. Now, think about it. Think about it. I mean, isn't that lovely? That's... That's... Uh, just let your imaginations play around that. That's, <laughs> that's an observation. You might say an aperçu of mine, to use a diplomatic expression. However, I, I like the Swedish backpackers. Beautiful. There they are in the old cistern, in their frayed denim crutch cutters and their see-through crop tops. And they're all gazing up at that beautiful um, ceiling by... Um, Andrew Lloyd Angelo, whatever his name is. <laughs> and I go up to them and I say, <clears throat> I say, yeah. I say, excuse, I, I say, uh, you like inspecting ceilings, do you? <laughs> I say, there's a beauty back at my motel that could interest you. <laughs> well, once they glance down and they see my diplomatic pouch, I mean, like Flynn. <laughs> But on this occasion, I get a tap on the shoulder and it's one of the Swiss guards. Now, I don't know if you know this, but crawling all over the old cistern are these Swiss guards. I mean, all dressed up, you know, they're Roman Catholic beef eaters. But I would say, <laughs> I would, you know, I'd place a bet that uh, by and large, 99% of them are pillow biters. I would say they would. <laughs> They're not pillow biters, they're mattress munchers. <laughs> they would be card carrying K pop crunches. <laughs> you know, I reckon if those blokes didn't drill for Vegemite, the Pope's a Jew. I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, ladies and gentlemen, here's a lovely one. Uh, what's the difference between a pufter and a microwave? <laughs> A microwave doesn't brown your meat. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Yeah. Lovely. Isn't it? You see, I'm introducing references to household appliances because this is a family show. It is. <laughs> God love you. 
God love you. The Lord be good to you all. Got a drop of the shardas there? Yeah. Got any more chardonnay in there? Only this. Well, that's it, love. Johnny Walker chardonnay. <laughs> well, beggars can't be choosers. If I was a drinking man, I'd take exception to that, Laurie. I want to drink a toast, good people. I want to drink to women. God love you. Because there's a smorgasbord of horn bags here tonight. <laughs> With one exception. And I... <laughs> you still there, Yvonne? Hey? Hello, darling, you come up here. I want you up here on stage. Come on! Come on, let's encourage her, ladies and gentlemen. God love you. Don't be nervous. You're nervous. Don't be. Isn't she beautiful? We go back a long way, ladies and gentlemen. She always used to say to me, Les, you go back a long way. <laughs> only, only her eyes were usually watering when she said that. Have you heard have you heard about global warming? Well this is how it's done. <laughs> oh Bonnie, Bonnie. I'm teasing you. I was always a scallywag, wasn't I? You on your own tonight? On your own? No, with a friend. With a friend. Yeah. Oh, you lucky bastard. <laughs> What's his name? It's, it's a girl. A girl? Yeah, <laughs> See, the operation is a complete success. <laughs> What's her name? Sandy. Sandy, eh? Sandy. What rhymes, Laurie? <laughs> come on up here, Sandy. Let's... Come on, come on. It's great. <laughs> Hello, darling. How are you? I kiss you again. Have you heard, have you heard much about Uncle Les, have you? <laughs> oh, I think, have you, got, have you got a soft spot for me? Because <laughs> I think I could develop a hard spot. <laughs> I think I could. No, oh, I'm not so bad. Oh, there's no ill in me. Yes, yes, you girls, you come with me, because I'll we'll have a little drink. I've got something in mind. I have. <laughs> Have, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. No. Now look, girls. Here's a drink, first of all. A little Johnny Walker Chardonnay. Get that up, you. There we are. You get this up, you. There we go. Now, girlies, you know what we're going to do tonight? Saturday night. We are going back to my semi-basement loft in Knightsbridge Road. <laughs> We're going to have a jacuzzi, a lovely little jacuzzi, and watch a video or two, and you like that, and perhaps even enjoy a sandwich. <laughs> and uh, I mean that in all sincerity, fellas, I do. Are you worried about the beef scare? Because I've got a bit of Australian... Uh, a bit of Australian grass-fed beef <laughs> that you girls will be only too happy to get your teeth into, eh? <laughs> Good luck and God love you. Have some guacamole too, I made. The old guacamole. Because I'm a bit of a Floydy boy. I am. I can cook. I can... I've got a man of many parts. And I enjoy cooking. I enjoy food. Now I don't drink or smoke because I've got my taste buds back. Les Patterson is not just a guru of the arts. I'm a connoisseur, a gourmet and a snacker. And when I run up a midnight feast for a couple of nice tarts, <laughs> I find they all like my salami on their cracker. <laughs> I used to feed them pickled onions with their ouzo lime and coke. 
but they always took a while to come on stream. Their preferred idea of fun was samosas and blue nun, washed down with lots of Bailey's Irish cream. Today, half market starters, a sun-dried tomatoes, they taste shit house, so hold your nose first. Or a dirty great bowler, green guacamole, guacamole. Oh, no! No, it's beautiful. And I only one thing for your thirst, which the ladies can drink till they burst. Chardonnay, Chardonnay, it's the upmarket drink of today. Although it's not busy, it's a beautiful prodigy. Act when you're in need of a lay. It used to be double tequilas that could prize off the pants of the sheilas. <laughs> But now they won't have it away, no way, for less than a large Chardonnay. Accountants drink it, and housewives sink it from a handy old Sainsbury's box. My girl Friday sips it before she unzips it and helps me get out of my socks. As a ripper refresher for a man under pressure, a Chardonnay's well worth the money. But here's the bad news. It tastes like any old booze when you cop it up into the dining. <laughs> it's the tipple that's come here to stay. It lubricates women from South End to Plin Lemon. I said Plin Lemon. Plin Lemon is a mountain in Wales. What's the matter with these shearers? <laughs> from Wick down to Old Colwyn Bay. No manly manoeuvre seems sinful to a lovely young girl with a skinful. They'll never scream, put that away. Thanks to you, Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Lizettes. assistance seem to offer the slightest resistance instead of patting their ass why not fill up their glass with Chardonnay ladies begging your pardon but I've got a slight hard on <laughs> And it's all thanks to Chardon. Ah, 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 away! Come on, 
vamos a seguir. No, vale. Boy, oh boy, that was lovely. And they were all former secretaries of mine, Laurie. They are. Uh, no worries. And I choose my secretary very carefully. I have to get a girl with the right calibre. Are you with me? I mean that in the ballistic sense. <laughs> but when I interview these girls, it may surprise you to learn I don't look up their CVs. I don't. Not immediately. I, I have a nice chat with them. I get them here. I sit them down. We have a lovely conversation. About 10 minutes. Admittedly, we touch on borderline subjects. It's a warm-up. And at the end of this titillating conversation, I asked her very politely, would they remove their panties? <laughs> and throw them into the air as high as they can. If they stick to the ceiling, the girl gets the job. She does. <laughs> Some blokes are born great, others have greatness thrust upon them, like me. The uh, oh, well, what's it been? A couple of months ago, I heard a knock on the door of my loft. Open the door, there's a figure from the past. David Meller. <laughs> like a bloody ghost. He looked a bit like me in 50 years' time, with glasses. <laughs> I said, Boy, oh, boy, I said, is it you, Dave? He said, yeah, Les. I said, oh, shit, a brick, mate. I said, you old scallywag. I said, what are you up to? He said, I'm diversifying, Les. He said, <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, I'm a, I'm a jack of all trades. I said, well, what are you up to now? He said, well, he said, I've got a little bit of money from various sources. And we've got the, a bit of lottery money augmenting that because the government doesn't want it all pissed up against the wall by the pillow biters. <laughs> so he said... <laughs> so... Uh, and, and the muff munchers. So he said... <laughs> so... Uh, he said... Uh, <laughs> so he said, Liz... He said, I'm fronting up an important new quango. I said, what's that? What's it called, Dave? He said, it's called C-U-N-T. <laughs> oh, I said, that rings a bell. <laughs> I said, what does it stand for, Dave? He said, it's a council for the understanding of perfectly natural tendencies. I said, there's a P in that. <laughs> he said, the P is silent. <laughs> the, the P is silent, as in... Cunt. <laughs> no, please, please, please. No, he said that, I didn't. He said it. <laughs> you got a fucking hyena down there. <laughs> I said, well, what is the per you know, what is, what is all about this CUNT organisation? He said, well, Les, he said, he said, CUNT is, is pretty stretched at the moment, he said, financially, <laughs> but uh, he said, our aim is to take a video of your lecture at the Whitehall Theatre and issue it as a, as a straight sex education video to schools, churches, religious institutions. <laughs> troubled teenagers who don't know whether they're coming or going. And he said it could save parents a lot of embarrassment. And he said, there's just one routine question we have to ask you, Liz. What is your definition of sex? I said, that's easy, Dave. I said, sex is the most beautiful thing that can take place between a happily married man and his secretary. That's what I said. <laughs> so I got the job, in short, and I'm very, very pleased. And I wish that when I was a young kid, a troubled teenager, someone had thrust a tool like this into my hands. <laughs> and uh, I have to pay tribute, though, to my dad, because my father did tell me something. And in a way, what my dad told me was the most important thing I've ever known about this mysterious and beautiful thing that takes place between us. <laughs> and I want to pay tribute to that man because there's a feeling here, I was going to mention him. The name is still sacred to me of my dad, but tonight there is such a lovely family feeling here. 
My father passed away very quietly in his sleep between the bar and the gents. Um, <laughs> when I was about seven and a half. I'll never forget that day. I was there at home by myself playing by myself with myself and uh, <laughs> a little mate of mine, Paddy Ryan, came in. He said, Les, Les, you've got to get up to the pub, get up to the harp of Aaron. He said, <laughs> He said, <laughs> he says, uh, you got to get up, up there, he said, because your dad is slipping away fast. <laughs> Not so fucking funny about that. <laughs> I went up there to that pub, and he's lying there, Laurie, on the floor. And I held his old head in my arms. And he said, oh, thank Christ you're here, little Les, he said. He said... I just have to tell you, but I'm going fast, he said, but I have to tell you the facts of life. I said, oh, don't, Dad. You know, I said, I'm only seven and a half. He said, oh, you're growing fast and you'll need this advice. And I will not rest easy until I tell you. So I said, all right, Dad. He said, little Leslie's voice getting fainter. You know, they'd called the, called the emergency medical services, but they were having a drink, you see. So <laughs> I'm, I'm down there. I said, what is it, Dad? He said, can you count, son? I'll never forget this. I said, yes, Dad, I can count to five. He said, that's all you need to know to make a woman supremely happy, Liz. I said, no. He said, you've got to remember this. So I said, well, what is it, Dad? He said, it's easy. All you've got to remember is, voice getting fainter, it's the second hole from the back of the neck. <laughs> And then his head slumped on one side. They were his last words. <laughs> but boy, oh boy, what wisdom was in that. <laughs> that has stood me in incredible stead all my life. What a fantastic rule of thumb that is. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? The second half on the back of the neck, and ladies and gentlemen, I have applied that in all my interpersonal relations with the opposite sex community. And I would say this, you know, but there are occasions, I don't know, I mean, you might be tired, might have had a few drinks. <laughs> you're ahead of me, you're ahead of me. I mean, when. Oh, perhaps you're in a fast-moving vehicle. <laughs> but you can sometimes get your sums a little bit wrong. <laughs> but I found that, by and large, 99.9% .9 of women are only too happy to point you in the right direction. <laughs> However, I would be a liar and a shithouse hypocrite if I didn't say to you that there is that rogue percentage <laughs> of the women folk who aren't necessarily too fussy about arithmetic. There are. <laughs> you with me? <laughs> There's one woman in particular that springs to my mind, Norma Major. Have you heard of her? <laughs> She says, please, Les, slip in the back way, will you? Please. She said, if the press, the media see you hammering on the front door of number 10, she said, they'll put two and two together and they will realise that you were given my husband, John O' Four Eyes. She'll say, you're giving him charisma coaching. She said, so when you come to number 10, use the back entrance, she said. Come in the mews, knock three times and I'll let you in. Because... You know, for a small emolument, I have been helping old Four Eyes Major, and I've done my best. In fact, a few months ago, I did, I did him a huge favour. He said, Les, we need a slogan. The Tory party needs a slogan for the inevitable election. He said, give us one. Help me, help me. Oh, I saw he was on his knees pleading with me. I said, funnily enough, Prime Minister, I've got the one for you, mate. I said, it came to me only last night. Uh, one of my girl Fridays said it, as a matter of fact. 
as she fell backwards onto the simulated acrylic kangaroo skin rug. <laughs> her brow lightly mantled with perspiration and a celebratory St. Moritz king size mentholated between her fingers. He said, well, what did she say? She said, hey, could we use that as a slogan for the Tory party? I said, no worries, four eyes. He said, well, what was it she said? This is what she said, I said. Yes, it hurt. Yes, it worked. <laughs> he said, Liz, can we put that on the posters? I said, no worries. He said, that's beautiful, but now, ladies and gentlemen, you know it's lovely romantic origin, don't you? <laughs> and so there it is now all over the country. Yes, it hurt. Yes, it worked. And he said, now we've got to get the young vote. I said, well, I said, you could put it on condoms. He said, yes. You could print it on condoms. I said, you could put, yes, it hurt. Yes, it worked. This insertion paid for and authorised by the Tory and Unionist Party of Great Britain, Smith Square, SW1. He said, you'd never get all that up the side of a Frenchie. I said, you speak for yourself, I never... <laughs> You know, I'm a spin doctor. I am, and I'm called upon for all sorts of things. Of course, uh, I've got a lot of diplomatic tasks to do, and the French, because they've been letting off their devices not far from Australian shores, have been sucking up to us now. They've been brown-nosing to the Australian government at a high level. So I was summoned when the Shiriaks were in town, the little Shiriaks, couple I was invited along for afternoon tea, you know, where no doubt they'd be sucking up to me as a high-level, high-flying Australian diplomat. <laughs> now, I happen to have a new secretary who's a bit of a veggie, you know. Uh, meat doesn't pass her lips, well, occasionally, but I mean, on the whole, <laughs> on the whole, she's into the veggies and she made me this lunch. I had five lentil burgers for lunch. <laughs> five lentil burgers. So even when I sat down at afternoon tea with these shiriacs, you know, I, I felt a little case of the horses and carts coming on. <laughs> I did. Well, well, I'm halfway through. I'm sitting next to Mrs. Shiriac, and my serviette fell off my lap. You know, well, nothing, nothing really stays on my lap for long. <laughs> It's not a stable surface. <laughs> the last time I dropped my serviette was intentional. I was having lunch with Sharon Stone, as a matter of fact, and I thought, well, if I'm crawling around under the table for a while, I might get a glimpse of the golden donut. I thought so. <laughs> uh, she, uh, <laughs> she hadn't been very communicative on the, uh, above the table level, but I thought, <laughs> Under the table, I might do a bit of lip reading, who knows? <laughs> However, uh, ladies and gentlemen, are you with me? Uh, just as I drop my serviette, I'm just about to get it. Madame Shiriak dives down, she said, Oh, excusez moi, monsieur, votre serviette est de sonde, permettez moi. And she's down there, and oh, I can't, couldn't resist it any longer. I let one go. <laughs> I opened my lunch. I gave her both barrels, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I must have hit seven on the rectum scale. She looked as though she was having a near-death fucking experience. I said, I said, off that from face, but I said that. I said, that was the Patterson Pacific test. You know, I'm helping the royals. I'm a bit of a courtier. <laughs> Princess Di is a close mate. And I, I like her, you know. We, I bumped into little Di in a health farm. I bumped into her, funnily enough, in the uh, colonic irrigation room. <laughs> That's not a nice place to bump into anyone or anything. But we got talking and what a conversation. She, oh, she's chatting away to me about, oh, clothes, shopping, Pop music, clothes, uh, shopping, <laughs> how to get 50 million out of the royal family, clothes, shopping. It was lovely. 
And uh, she told me about this shit house thing called bulimia. I knew nothing about it. I thought it bulimia was just Malibu spelt backwards. That's what I thought. <laughs> And uh, she said, oh, it's a shithouse thing, Les, or words to that effect. She said, uh, <laughs> he said, uh, you're being sick all the time, you know? I said, oh, it's not unusual in Australia, die. I said, <laughs> in the average meal, a family will be sick, well, I will spew about five times during a meal. <laughs> She's different, Les, you know, how it had got me, and this is a rotten thing. She told me in confidence, so please, this must go no further. <laughs> She said, I had to go into the toilet, lock the door, put two fingers in my mouth and tickle the back of my throat. <laughs> I said, does it have to be fingers? I said, But we, in com we've got something in common. We love visiting intensive care. We love it. And I find visiting intensive care a turn on, as a matter of fact. I find it sexually arousing. I think it's pushing my way through those big floppy doors. I think it is. I think so. It reminds me of something. Being born, I suppose. And I said to her, Di, how can we cheer you up, darling? She said, oh, I said, look, would you like to cuddle some underprivileged, traumatised creature? Oh, yes, Liz, she said. I'd love that. She said, I've got a cuddling vacancy in January the 15th. <laughs> she said, is it a baby with AIDS? She said. I said, well, no. I said, as a matter of fact, the, the person I have in mind is my wife, Gwen. I said, uh, she hasn't got AIDS, but she's got hearing AIDS. So she, never we she never wears them because no one talks to her. And I said, she's, she's not a baby, but she can piss the bed with the best of them, I said. <laughs> and I say that as a tribute to that wonderful woman I married because my wife is a marvellous woman, the woman who waits. She, she's the best kid in the world. God love her. The Lord be good to Gwen. She's been drinking a little bit lately. She, uh, she, she's never unsteady on her feet. Drinks in bed. God bless her. But the doctor's given her the Prozac and the Valium and she's in a world of her own. But she's a marvellous woman. She's given me those two kids, Craig and Karen. God love her. Uh, and... Uh, I've tried, I've tried to revitalise our sex life. I've done my best. Don't think I'm a chauvinist. I've tried with that woman. As a matter of fact, when I was last out in Australia, I, I went up to the bedroom with her and she was glassy-eyed, you know. I said, darling, I said, we've got to put some pep into our interpersonal relations. I said, let's try something new, something different. I said, I said how about a bit of coitus interruptus? <laughs> went completely over her head. It did. As a matter of fact, she was lying there. She was, what's the matter with you? Went over the hyena's head as well, I think. She, she was lying there suffering from withdrawal symptoms. In the, in the eyebrows, uh, on the on the bed lamp and all over the tea's made. <laughs> God love Gwen, but the big problem for Gwen, and it is a shithouse problem she's got, is the, is the hemorrhoids. She's got the hemorrhoids very, very badly, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, it's a bastard. It's, these hemorrhoids she's got, oh. She makes light of it, that's her courage. You know, she pretends it's fashionable, you know. <laughs> Costume jewellery for the freckle. <laughs> I got the doctor to her and I said, you've got to do something, she's suffering. And he's prescribed these suppositories. Now, they're huge, these bloody suppositories, as those sufferers here will know. They're like, they're like submarines, um, except you never get a crew for them. I mean, you, you might. <laughs> you, you get a midget with low self-esteem. But it'd be a... It's a one-way trip to hell, wouldn't it be? 
a one-way trip to hell. Her problem, though, is administering them. Uh, administering this medication because she's got very short arms. <laughs> and she's put on a lot of weight. I mean, how do you know when your wife suddenly put on weight? <laughs> when she sits on your face and you can't hear the stereo. <laughs> However, no. She's tried, it. her arms are so short, she's got to sit down to have a cup of tea. And ladies and gentlemen, she's tried everything for the administration of this medication. She's tried the golf tea technique, like putting one on a golf tee and jumping on it. She's tried that. She's tried the chewing gum on the wall and backing up onto it. She nearly knocked down the fucking house. She was so upset that when I come on this trip to talk to you, she was crying. She said, what am I going to do when you're in England and I get my old trouble? And I, I took that woman in my arms. I cradled this woman, the mother of Craig and Karen. In my arms, I said, darling, Gwenny. I said, what are neighbours for? <laughs> a phone call. I don't know if you heard it through the curtain. Did you see me on the phone earlier? I did. That was Gwen ringing from Sydney. She said, I had my old trouble today, Les, and I've done what you said. I said, what, were you, what happened? She said, well, she said, I was at my post, you know, that's at the, you know, the sink, wrist deep in the grey water with the peas and mutton fat floating in it. <laughs> and she said, I was there, you know. And I looked out the window and I saw I had the old trouble. Give me buggery, this trouble. And I looked out the window and there were two little kiddies playing in the street. One of them was little Danny, a beautiful kid from across the road, freckles, little fair hair, beautiful kid. And she yells out, Danny, would you like to earn a shilling and buy yourself <laughs> some sweeties? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is a beautiful story you're going to hear now. This is something you'll cherish. You'll pass it on. It's like a parable. It's like one of them all sub fucking fables. <laughs> so this kid comes into the kitchen. My wife gives him the tablet like a bloody torpedo. And she's a woman of few words. And particularly with the medication, it's all like she's got a mouthful of cotton wool anyway. But she's always been a believer in body language, my Gwen. So the boy's there holding this, and all she does, very simply and rather beautifully, is to bend over and throw her dress over her head. <laughs> she's down there for a long time, and the little boy's wandering around the kitchen holding this, and he doesn't know what to do because he has not had specific instructions. <laughs> And Gwen is down there, and the blood is rushing to her head. And in the end, she yells out, Hey, hey, Danny, what are you doing? She said, I've been down here for five minutes. And he said, Oh, Lady Patterson. He says, Lady Patterson, I've just got a couple of questions. She said, All right, what are they? She straightens up. And he comes round and he says, um, She says, Yes, what is it? And this is the lovely bit. <laughs> Is it too late to turn back, Laurie, on this one? <laughs> Why not? I'll go for it. He says, uh, she says, yes. He said, do I throw it in the brown hole? Or do I feed it to the turkey? <laughs> No way. Isn't it marvellous the things that kids come out with? 
And you could tell that anywhere, couldn't you? I just have, for Christ's sake. But it's lovely to think that tonight, when you all go home, there'll be a few old Sheilas crawling around on top of their dressing tables with the adjustable mirrors. <laughs> playing a game of Hunt the Turkey. <laughs> and what lovely a game to play at this time of year. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, all good things come to an end. And I, I, I'm glad that we haven't got old Dave in or anyone coming on after me because I am, I'm a hard act to follow. There's music to that. <laughs> Most of the women who have met me never forget me, I have been told. Putting it crudely, girls who've laid me Say when nature made me She chucked away the mold When they first see me in my birthday suit The ladies go goggle-eyed and ashen But when they've climbed the first hurdle Every horny young bird will agree I'm a man built for passion <laughs> I'm a hard act to follow They say I should be in the Guinness Book I'm a hard act to follow At my last checkup, 20 nurses had a look <laughs> Jealous blokes have tried to do my reputation harm. They reckon it's technique that gives love making all its charm. But who needs technique when you've got one like a baby's arm? <laughs> Maiden's friends, such a hard, hard act to follow. They never feel the same way after Liz. Some ladies throw a fit when my equipment comes on view, but I always bung some chewing gum on the far tip of my cue. I say hop aboard and I'll stop pushing when you start to chew. <laughs> Like that Greek god Apollo. I'm not built like any dick or Tom or Harry. <sighs> when my secretary got married, I gave away the bride. I said, I hope that Max, your hubby, will keep you satisfied. Then she whispered, Les, I love him. But it doesn't touch the side. <laughs> it's a hard fact to swallow. But when I'm in the cot with my Max, it's a fucking anti climax. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stick an encore up here. A hardcore encore. It's a country song with an emphasis on the first syllable. It's dedicated to a little town that's dear to my heart and dear to the hearts of many fellows here tonight. Let's call it Tuna Town. <laughs> well, I do a lot of traveling. I'm always on the road. And in my life I carry a large and weary load But when I've reached my destination It's all gonna be alright Cause there's one dumb thing that's certain I'll be parting the old beef curtain and riding a good old pigskin bus into Tuna Town tonight. <laughs> and now let's hear it for the Blizzards! <laughs> well, I meet a lot of women in the diplomatic corps. But I gotta admit, not every Sheila bangs like a shit house door. But I've got a little secretary, all tucked up out of sight. And she's waiting for me to get home from the pub to stick me key in a well oiled chub. <laughs> one done thing is certain, I'll be parting the old beef curtain, riding a good old pigskin bus in a tuna town tonight. I gotta admit that I sometimes stray well every now and then but I don't want ugly rumors reaching the ears of me old wife when she's the mother of Craig and Karen she's old and she's tired and she's tight but I got a little horn bag on my lap with a velvet mouse trap ready to snap who went till I got home from the pub to stick me key in a well-oiled chub I'll be part of the old beef cut Riding the good old pigskin bus in the Tuna Town tonight <laughs> So all you macho fellas On your bean bags with your beer Hear the wise words of Leslie Words that have cost me dear when a girl gives you the vertical smile. <laughs> Don't let her out of your sight. Cause you could soon be having the ultimate hump. You could whip out the blue vein junket pump. A little horn <laughs> bag on your lap. A velvet mousetrap ready to snap. Who waited till you got home from the pub to stick your key in a well oiled chump. For one done thing you should. You'll be fine. Pump with a little horn bag on your lap, a velvet mousetrap ready 
in a snap. When the union holds the pub, there's a key in a well-known jumbo. What's her name? You're sure. Give me part of the old people. 